All right, perfect. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Today, I am honored to introduce Doug Ptolemy. He is the author of Nature's Best Hope, which we have in the library. Uh, also, Bringing Nature Home, and we'll soon have the uh, Young Readers Edition uh, available in the library as well. Uh, he is also the founder of Homegrown National Park, which we'll learn a little bit about. Uh, his work has shined a light on the reality of Earth's dwindling wildlife populations and the role of native plants in their preservation and recovery. As you've been researching the causes and impacts of climate change, you've also been wondering about what we can do. Uh, Doug has helped us see one way to make an individual difference and collectively a significant and important one. So Dr. Talmy, we're happy to have you with us today. We appreciate the work that you're doing to uh, protect our native wildlife. Well, thank you very much. Um, and we do have a lot to talk about, so I'm gonna jump right in uh, and tell you what my idea of nature's best hope is. And I will give you a spoiler, you are nature's best hope. So I'm really gonna tell you about why I think so. But before I do that, let's talk about what Edward O. Wilson's idea of nature's best hope was, a very famous professor at Harvard, um, he died the day after Christmas two years ago, but one of the things that was consistent throughout his 60-year career uh, was to protect biodiversity on planet Earth. He loved the life on our planet, and he wanted to protect it, not just because he loved it, but because he knew it was essential to human survival. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life, and he had one simple message, if we're going to save life anywhere, on planet Earth, we're gonna to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. Otherwise it's gonna disappear everywhere. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Um, now, it sounds like a great idea. It is a great idea. Uh, we just put all the things that are declining in one half of the Earth and we'll live in the other half and it'll be great. Part of the problem, though, is that um, half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture, and we've got 8 billion people with all of our houses and roadways and airports and detritus and the other half, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So a lot of people wondering, how can we possibly do this? And that's basically what I want to talk about today. I do think we can realize E.O. Wilson's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to do that. Before we talk about that, though, let's talk about what happened on the East Coast in 2019. We had a very large oak mast. Members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head. Then it forced its head through there. Then it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze. Finally, when it plops down, that's a very dangerous time for this insect larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface, it takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, converts itself to a pupa. And then surprisingly, stays in that underground chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts to a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around, lay an egg in that hole, and that's how the larva gets into the acorn. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the next year the way most insects would? And the answer is it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once the acorn weevil leaves the acorn, it leaves a hole, kind of like a true vacuum. And you may have heard that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she's filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony fill, lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they've left the acorns. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn. That takes about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard here to make sure nobody else comes in. And this is where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. 
What's my point with this little story? Well, that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They will take an acorn and fly up to a mile from the parent tree. And then they tap it below the surface of the soil. And the object is they're gonna go back in the wintertime and have something to eat. Well, for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have this plant, facilia. That is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees, and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. You won't have this butterfly, the uh, Baltimore checker spot, unless you have white turtle head. That's the only host plant that it can develop on. So I can talk all, all week, all year about nature specialized relationships. Point I want to make today, though, is that these relationships, nature itself, is now on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave most of the country as it was. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And those are typically mountaintops. And that's because we've logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in this country. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. You can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need, because it is that nature that keeps us alive on this planet. So you might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this, and I don't know. But I suspect we thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But we were wrong about that, and that's why we're seeing some scary headlines today, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. It's a third of our North American bird population already gone. UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. Um, makes a nice headline, but it's not an option, folks. We have to make sure this doesn't happen, and we can make sure this doesn't happen. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, that's upon all of our houses. But that is not what this talks about. This talks about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and me. Those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost its insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper. The little things that run the world. And again, his message was very clear. Believe it or not, life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals, those food webs would collapse and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients, and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, we humans wouldn't, have, wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is good news here. There is good news, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we are going to have to change the way we landscape to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. And here are just a few of the things that plants do every day that we depend on, like 
produce oxygen, pretty important. The cleaner water and slow its journey to the sea or it becomes too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and building their tissues out of that carbon and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground where it's stable for thousands of years. Plants are building topsoil, holding it in place, preventing floods, dampening severe weather, converting sunlight into food. You know, if we lose our plants, we're going to have to eat sunlight, and that'll be hard. What are animals doing for plants? Lots of things, but these are big ones. They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but it's a terrible idea because of those 8 billion people that are demanding more and more ecosystem services every day. Now, we do have parks, we do have preserves. They're doing the best they can, but it's not good enough. And that's why we are now in the sixth great extinction event that the planet has ever experienced. There is a fix, though, and that is to start practicing conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like this. In the past, of course, conservation has worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, let's go back to private property. Most of the country is privately owned. 78% of the country is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S is privately owned, <clears throat> east of the Mississippi. So if we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm not using it correctly. We do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left out there, but we've got to go beyond that. We need to rebuild nature and all those places we've, we've dismantled her. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the ones that contribute the most. And there are two groups that we can't do without. One is the flowering plants. And of course, the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. Plants are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into simple sugars and carbohydrates, which is the food that supports just about all the animals on the planet. So plants making the, the food and storing it in their plant parts, mostly in their leaves. Well, if you don't get that food to animals, you don't have any animals. And if you don't have any animals, you don't have functioning ecosystems. And it turns out that most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate plants. And most of those invertebrates are insects and not just any insect. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, that is the chickadee that we have around here, the chickadee at our, our feeders eating seeds all winter long. <clears throat> and we tend to think that's all chickadees need. But even in the wintertime, only half of their diet is seeds. The other half is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. And when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So they switch entirely to invertebrates and not just any invertebrate. If they are in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. One of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is uh, exoskeleton, it's made of chitin, it's undigestible. But because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty, pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger, they just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you wanna chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They are nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin, of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. Uh, and beetles, many beetles have very sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate. And you're a vertebrate. Birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. 
only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? Uh, well, from those prey items that they're bringing back to the nest. But look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars. Here are the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating the green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are, in the green leaves. Only the caterpillars are eating the green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, that is a good question. So let's go back to chickadees. We've got a lot of data on Carolina chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, where they fledge. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees only forage about 50 meters from the nest. Most birds forage very close to the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not include all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that people are measuring. Uh, this is the group that, that did that study that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years, a Smithsonian group. And what we did was go to their, their paper and look at their original data and divide the terrestrial bird species in North America into two groups, the species that require insects and the species that do not require insects. Some species like finches and doves can actually reproduce on uh, milk that uh, they make out of seeds. So they don't need insects. And look, their populations didn't lose numbers at all in the last 50 years, very stable. But the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. So we need to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to do one thing, be pretty. Now we ask them to do two things, be pretty and be ecologically functional. And they're not gonna be ecologically functional unless we add caterpillars to those landscapes. So how do we add caterpillars to those landscapes? Well, you do that by adding the plants that, that support those caterpillars. And that seems pretty straightforward, but there is a catch. And that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which plants we choose for our landscapes. And we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. This is a monarch butterfly larva. Uh, and you can have all of the, the plants from Asia that we typically landscape with, the burning bush and the barberry and the calorie pear and the privet and the, the hostas and the ginkgos, typical landscape plants. You can have all of them in your yard, but you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to make a monarch butterfly is if you have one of the milkweed species in your yard, because that's all monarchs eat. That's called host plant specialization, and it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. Why is that? Really important point here. Because plants have made them specialize. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me, after, after the lecture today, go outside and eat a plant. See if you like it. You're not gonna like it. It's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants, so almost all of them can only eat particular plants 
for which they have specialized adaptations that allow them to get around those chemical defenses. Specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history with those particular plants for all those adaptations to fall into place. But once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. So if you move into a house and you take the milkweeds out of your yard and you replace them with hostas, the monarch's not gonna be able to start to develop on hostas. The only thing it can eat is milkweed. So it has two choices, fly away and find milkweed someplace else or starve to death. It turns out this is very simple. There are three kinds of plants out there. Plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs and plants that actively remove energy from local food webs. The best example of a contributor is one of the species of oaks that we have in this country. We have 91 species of oaks, uh, and they are always at the top of the list wherever they occur in terms of supporting food webs. A good example of a non-contributor would be, this is a ginkgo biloba from Asia or any of the Asian ornamentals. Um, nothing eats a ginkgo, so it's not adding any energy to the local food web. And a good example of a detractor, something removing energy from local food webs, would be the ornamentals that are invasive. They have escaped our yards. This is calorie pear or Bradford pear. Um, very few things can eat Bradford pear, but look, it doesn't stay in our yards. It escapes and pushes out the native plants that do support food webs. So therefore, it's actually removing energy from the local food webs. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're going to restore those food webs that to rebuild the ecosystems that we destroyed in some point in the past, we're going to have to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work. When we do choose the right plants, starting with my house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. So where my wife Cindy and I moved in the year 2000, it was to a, uh, a farm that it was broken up into 10 acre lots. And the last thing they did was to mow it for hay. So we wanted to destroy the, to restore, not destroy, to restore this local ecosystem. And the best way to do that is to get those caterpillars back. we would never done this before. So I wanted to see uh, how easy it would be to get, for example, the Canadian outlet, this pretty little caterpillar to start making a living at my house. That's what the adult looks like. Well, you might have guessed we need the plant that supports the Canadian outlet, and it is called meadow row. That's the only thing they eat, and our property did not have any meadow row. So I got some meadow row seeds, and I planted them, and they grew very nicely. But um, this was early on. I'd never done this before, and I actually had very little faith that Canadian outlets would be able to find my meadow row. So I didn't go out and check it for a good two months after I planted it. But then I was walking by for another reason, and I looked over, and it was covered with Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. I'm still impressed with that. Uh, so now we've got good populations of Canadian outlets and good populations of meadow row, which means we've added two species to the property that didn't used to be there. The restoration has begun. Same story with this beautiful moth, the goldenrod stowaway. It's actually a misnomer, it has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. We didn't have any Biden's Aristos at home, but I did know where there was some Biden's in a power line cut in Bear, Delaware, excuse me, about 14 miles away. So I went and got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. As a matter of fact, last summer, they took over my front yard. That's okay. Um, well, I had to wait a year for the Goldenrod Stowaway to find my Biden's, but they did. And now I've got a good population of both of these. So now we've added four species to the property. I wanted the Hackberry Emperor to make a living at, at my house, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs there. It's one of the species that should be there. And as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry, on Celtus. We didn't have any Hackberry. So I got some Hackberry trees, planted them. It took four years for the butterfly to find my Hackberry trees, but they did. And now we've got a good population of both of these. So now we've added six species to the property. And again, that's how the rest, restoration proceeded. I did not plant goldenrod, came, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that support goldenrod, like the beautiful brown, brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. There are 110 species of moths that use goldenrod. Planted Virginia creeper. 
Now you might've heard some people don't like Virginia creeper, but it's actually a great native plant. It's got good fall color. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's a good ground cover, makes nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. And by nutritious, I mean, they're very high in fat. That's what migrating birds need. It's what overwintering birds need. It's a great pollinator plant. Even though it has tiny little inconspicuous flowers, you don't even know when it's in bloom until you see this big cloud of native bees around it. They love it. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I planted Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moth caterpillars that are a primary component of cardinal diets. Things like Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Wanted to see if I could get the double tooth prominent at our house just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. It looks like a stegosaurus. Even if you don't like caterpillars, you got to like this guy. What's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm? And of course, we didn't have any American elm. They all disappeared decades ago because of the Dutch elm disease. But there are two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. So I got some seeds from them, planted them at home. They grew very nicely, germinated in six days, and they grew quickly. Uh, those trees are now 80 feet tall. And yep, they brought in the double tooth prominent. So another big success, American elm. Want to see if I get the evening primrose moth at our house because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, we didn't have any evening primrose, believe it or not, Enothera. So I planted that. The moth came, spends a day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's very crowded, but it's always very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Now, these are uh, just examples of the plants that we put back at our house. But I wanna focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old, it's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not gonna plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you will not. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local food web, and remember that's one of our goals now in landscaping. You can enjoy your oak the very first year. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or as two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to call in the moths that create the caterpillars that run the food web at my house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the Variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of oaks have come to the, no, of caterpillars have come to the oaks on my property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to contribute to your local food web. It will do it the very first year. This is what our, our yard typically looks like. It's where the Bidens moved in last summer, but just to show you that uh, we put a lot of plants back. And my research has shown that if you know the number of moss species in your local food web, it's a very good index of how stable and productive that food web is. So five years ago, I started to take pictures of every species of moth I could find on our property. I am still at it, but I'm up to 1,199 species of moths that I've seen so far making a living on our property because we put the plants back. Now we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we are supporting 44% of all the moths in the entire state. And because so many of these are types of bird food, we've recorded 61 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline that we see all the time. The World Wildlife Fund says Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? We really could turn these terrible statistics around. But I know what you might be thinking. You know, we, we've got 10 acres here. A lot of people have less land than that. Will it work on smaller properties in, say, suburbia? That's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, where they have 0.6 acres. 
18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Um, they're in the middle of a development. Everybody around them has the big lawns. When they moved in, their yard was choked with a serious invasive called Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. So they got rid of that. Then they planted 70 species of native plants, put in a water feature that they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds using their property. And they're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species, a wonderful number. Uh, Cindy and I have only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, she's right next to O'Hare Airport. Pam has one tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average uh, lot size in North America. She's not connected to any natural area at all. It's a pretty one tenth of an acre because Pam is a native plant landscaper, but she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in uh, 60 species of native plants, including a water feature. And then she sat back and counted the birds using her yard. She's up to 124 bird species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there's three things we need to think about if we're gonna succeed in a big way. And we do wanna succeed in a big way. And one of them is we've got to shrink the area we've got in a lawn. We have. 44 million acres of lawn uh, these days. That's an area bigger than all of New England combined, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Why do we do that? Well, we do that because it's a status symbol and because we have to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? So let's make the math simple. Let's say we got 40 million acres of lawn. We're going to cut that in half. That'll give us 20 million acres that we can build a new national park with. We can restore them right at home. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyon Lands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all this park, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park would be the biggest park in the country. You can join Homegrown National Park. Um, it's free. You just uh, register where your property is and the amount of land on your property that you're going to be a good steward of. Maybe you really are going to reduce the area you have in lawn. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to put an aster in a flower pot. That all counts. And when you do that, your piece of your county is going to, I guess we're over here, is going to light up and you'll get to see who else uh, as, as joined Homegrown National Park in your area. The object, of course, is to get the message that we all are the future of conservation. We want that message to go viral. We want the whole country to light up. What are we asking? Well, at Homegrown National Park, we really are asking people to reduce the area in lawn. Lawn is not contributing anything to what we need. Uh, and replace that, that lawn with uh, more important native plants, the big contributors. Remove invasive species, the species from another country that have escaped and are, are pushing out our, our native plants. If we have invasive species on our properties, we do want to remove them and protect any natural areas that are, properties, that are on our properties. We have ecological products, significant increase in biodiversity. And you can see that's what's happened at, at uh, my house just by putting the plants back. Measurable reduction in invasive species. You know, if 85% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned and we all got rid of the invasives on our private property, we'd be 85% done. Significant drawdown of, of atmospheric CO2. When you convert your lawn into plantings like this, uh, that is pulling a lot of carbon out of the air. Lawn is the worst plant for carbon sequestration. So anything else is better which means you're helping climate change. And you're also creating viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. Uh, and for every bit of habitat we create outside of a park and preserve, we're helping the animals inside the park and preserve. There are sociological products as well, national awareness, not just to what the problem is, but what the solutions are. We're trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature's not optional, it's essential, and that everybody, owns responsibility to sustaining it. We wanna convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action is even better. And merge existing uh, wild, uh, national conservation efforts like Audubon and National Wildlife Federation and Wild Ones and Sierra Club, all the local land trusts. Uh, we want them all to get on the map so that we have one visual for how well we are doing in terms of conservation.
So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to join Homegrown National Park. What plants should we put on our properties uh, where lawn used to be? I'm going to argue that some of them have to be what I call keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch will collapse. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web will collapse because the keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of that caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building in your yard as the two by fours that hold that house up. They are essential. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do with our ornamental plants from other countries for the last century. What is the best keystone plant uh, in terms of supporting caterpillars? Uh, well, in 84% of the counties in which they occur in North America, it's one of the oaks. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. If you want to know where the very best plants are where you live, you go to um, National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder, put in your zip code, and the ranked list of the best woody plants and the best herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of insects into our yard, and we're going to kill them with our security light, which of course is not the goal. These are all the ways that, that light pollution at night is killing insects. It's one of the major causes of insect decline uh, around the world. But you know, to me, this is good news because we've got to stop insect decline. We've already lost more than 45% of, of Earth's insects. If we can stop it and turn it around by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. There are a lot of switches to flick, but there's a lot of us to switch those, flick, flick those switches. But I know what uh, people say, well, gee, I can't turn the light out over my, my barn or over my garage or over my, my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you'll notice is the bad man does not come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow incandescent, yellow LED, they both work. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than our white wavelengths. If we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we could save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, millions of dollars as well. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to uh, put in keystone plants. We're going to modify our light system. Then we're going to uh, hire one of the mosquito fogging companies to come kill all of our all of our insects. You know, these companies say it's okay. What we're fogging is a natural product. And, and it's true. It's a natural product. It's pyrethroids, which they extract from chrysanthemums. But that's not a good argument because cyanide is a natural product. Cyanide is an organic product. Ricin is a natural product. Nature makes a lot of really nasty things. So just because it's natural doesn't mean it's okay. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. And that's not even close to true. It kills all the insects it comes in contact with, which look, is all the insects, um, including monarchs, by the way, including all of our pollinators. There was a big monarch kill two years ago, hundreds of dead monarchs after they flew through Mosquito Joe. The interesting thing is it does not control mosquitoes. Very hard to control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You have to kill 90% of them. These fogging companies kill between 10 and 50%. So they're not even close to being effective. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it with biocontrol through mosquito dunks. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay, put that out in the sun for a couple of days. It'll build up the population of diatoms and algae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. That becomes an irresistible brew to the adult female mosquitoes in your yard. They will lay their eggs in your yard. Then you go to the hardware store and you get a sheet of uh, mosquito dunks, $12. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So it's very targeted, it's very cheap. And if everybody did it, it really would control mosquitoes. But you know what? If you don't want to kill anything and you just want to enjoy your backyard, get a fan and turn it on and sit in the breeze. The mosquitoes don't fly into the breeze. It's very effective. Can we use native plants in formal designs? Yes, we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design taken by a drone 400 feet up. You don't get more formal than that. And every plant in that landscape is a native plant. 
Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. Everybody loves them in Europe. And maybe that's because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a typical yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Put a fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells your neighbor it's not just a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It's pretty when it's in bloom. It meets the needs of several species of bees. It's not very big, could be bigger. Uh, but if everybody did it, it would help a lot. Help what? Help make pollinators. Why do we need pollinators? Well, if you listen to the news, they'll say because they pollinate a third of our crops. That's not actually true. They pollinate about a 12th of our crops. And I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the agriculture argument. We need pollinators and we need them everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants, not just our crops. How about this? A Drew Latham design much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. Seems like a no brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can. And more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost sharing plan. In other words, the state is helping pay homeowners to convert some or all of their lawn to appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. Uh, it's a very popular program. Pennsylvania has a similar uh, program. It's got a waiting list at this point. There's an island off of Florida that is paying homeowners to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. Burrowing owls are a listed species, an endangered species. This is the way the uh, Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're gonna pay you to, to take care of it rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a bounty on these invasive ornamentals like calorie pear. That's what St. Louis, Missouri did, Fayetteville, Arkansas, South Carolina has, has banned them all together. North Carolina has a bounty on. If you take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. Water utilities are giving people $100 coupons to plant water efficient native plants. And of course the big lawn reduction programs, particularly in California, this is going up now. You get $3 per square foot for every square foot of lawn that you remove, $3 rebate. Okay, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one's a big one, it's important. We're starting to think uh, that nature is just optional. We like nature, it's not that we don't like it. We like to ride our bikes in it or go bird watching or just stand and watch. But we don't think it's essential, which means when, when push comes to shove and resources are in short supply, which is always, nature takes a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and there's this wall size poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We wanna save nature, save wildlife so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for expanding the national park system. Beautiful places, we wanna protect them so that future generations can enjoy it. And I understand that because nature is enormously entertaining, but it is far more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about that. But if we continue with that, that uh, idea, which is not at all true, if we restrict conservation just to the areas where there's not a lot of humans, uh, we're gonna fail because those areas are too few, too isolated uh, and, and too small. David Quammen has an excellent analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I don't like that language because it suggests there's places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so, every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our schoolyards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks, we've got to put the plants back, not just to make biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to recreate viable habitats in all the areas where we destroyed them. This is starting to happen. 
This is really starting to happen. And when it does happen, it'll be the first time in modern history that we humans have coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, since every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody share the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We've been very good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching uh, our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship, not just some of us, but all of us. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. A lot of people are recognizing that there's, there are serious environmental issues on the planet, but everybody feels powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can, can put in a pollinator garden. One person can remove the invasive plants on their property. One person can use keystone plants. Uh, one person can modify their light system. One person can fire Mosquito Joe. One person can do all of those things quite easily and uh, revitalize the ecosystem on their property and then enhance their local ecosystem. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just think about the piece of the planet you can influence. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you that's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a, a land conservancy or a park or preserve. They are all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power. And we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. I think I've convinced my own grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, so at this point, if um, those of you who have some questions, if you want to go ahead and put them in the Q&A section, and I will read them out as, as they come. Um, so. Uh, Doug, we were, I was surprised, but one of the first things that came up was they wanted to know your credentials. So <laughs> oh, you should have lengthened your. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Doug and I had a conversation about that prior to starting and we said, oh, we don't think that the, that uh, you would all want to know that, but you do. So I'm going to read a little bit about this and then you can fill in any blanks. All right. All right. Um, so Doug is a professor uh, in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. Uh, he has taught courses in insect taxonomy, behavioral ecology, humans and nature, and insect ecology. Uh, chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways that insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. He is the author of several books, as I mentioned earlier, including the New York Times bestseller, Nature's Best Hope, Bringing Nature Home, uh, and which was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association, The Nature of Oaks, and The Living Landscape, which is co-authored with Rick, uh, Rick Dark. He has won the Garden Club of America Medal of Conservation and is the 2018 American Horticultural Society Communication Award. Uh, so is there anything else that... Uh, that you'd like more to than enough. That is more than enough. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, Doug is very humble, um, and uh, you know, the, not only did he uh, write these these books and uh, worked on these studies, uh, but these are obviously really important. Uh, it's really important work. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. Okay, uh, teachers, if you would go ahead and have your students ask some questions and post them. Okay, we, here we have one. Okay, so this is a question from our climate action and sustainability team. What do you rec what do you recommend if there is a blight or infestation killing our plants? How do we remove it safely while preserving the ecosystem? 
Okay, great question. Uh, we do have blights and we do have pests, uh, but almost all of them are introduced. So the gypsy moth, which is now the spongy moth, uh, the emerald ash borer, the hemlock woolly adelgid, these are all insects we brought in from other countries that have no natural enemies. So they run amok and they're killing lots of things. We have a number of diseases, plant diseases we brought in particularly that are hitting our oaks. Again, all introduced diseases. Um, so they create huge problems because again, they are here without uh, natural controls. Um, Everybody says to me, well, fix it. <laughs> the real fix is to not bring these things in to begin with, but um, biological control is a very powerful tool where you bring in the, the uh, natural enemies of these um, primarily insects or, or is the escape plants as well and hope that they deliver control. Sometimes it works spectacularly well. Usually um, it works a little bit, but not, not enough to get great control. Um, we don't have, uh, there's not much we can do for, for plant diseases other than wait for resistance to evolve. So um, almost all of the diseases uh, don't kill all the members of a population. There are a few that have some resistance, uh, then we have to wait for them to reproduce and, and uh, replace the ones that are susceptible. But trying to save the ones that are susceptible, it eh, just doesn't work, so... It's a real good question. Um, the real the real answer is let's stop importing things that that hurt us. But I know that's hard for you to control. So, <laughs> right, but we can right. So by not, but in in some small way by not um, planting the things that would have those uh, particular that, things. that would okay. do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next question has to do with these native garden kits, and so I wanted to show make sure that all the uh, seventh graders saw that those are a few of them we have about about 200 uh, ready to go. Um, they will be ready to go uh, for you all. And please make sure that your parents are uh, are signing up to pick one up. Uh, we'll deliver them to you to take home. Uh, but the question is, what is the best advice you can give us for starting a native po uh, pollinator garden here at Rosa and then also at home? Well, these kits are a wonderful start. I mean, they're, they're being handed the plants. That's usually what, what slows people down. Where do I get these native plants? So here you're being handed them, um, put them in, uh, take care of them. You know, a big, a big challenge when you plant these native plants is deer. We've got too many deer and you're going to have to protect them from deer until they, they get, if they're woody plants, they have to get to the point where the deer can't hurt them. If they're herbaceous plants, you're probably going to have to protect them all the time. Uh, the pollinators can get through any fencing that you have, but uh, the deer, we've got 14 times more deer than the environment can sustain, uh, and they eat all this stuff. So that's another huge problem. Before we, you know, while we're waiting to save that, just protect the plants that you're putting in. Uh, and the more area that you cover with these plants, the more you're going to help. A lot of people say, well, gee, I just have one little yard. It's not going to be, you know, enough help. It's not going to, it's too small to make a difference. But remember, your little yard is attached to another little yard, which is attached to another little yard. And the object is to get everybody to do this. And then everybody's got, got big, big properties. So there's no doubt, the bigger, the better, the more plants, the better, the more, more lawn we move, the better. And you can be a part of that. That's the important thing. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, what is the best way to deal with our spotted lanternflies? <laughs> Another pest we just brought in, we brought them in on uh, rocks from China. Ornamental rocks from China had egg masses on them. And this is the problem. We brought in ornamental rocks from, from China because there are no ornamental rocks in all of North America, which of course is ridiculous. We don't have to do this. So what do you do? You know, unless you own an orchard or unless you own a vineyard, um, you probably don't have to do much of anything because um, there's no records of them actually killing trees. They can build up to tremendous numbers, uh, but uh, we've got somebody in my own department looking for natural enemies of these things. Um, their favorite host plant is another invasive plant, Alanthus. So if you have any Alanthus on your property, make sure you get rid of that. Uh, but they will develop on other plants, but when they do, they taste good. When they develop on Alanthus, they taste bad. Uh, and the object is to teach the birds in your neighborhood 
if you don't have any lanthus, that these bugs actually taste good and they will learn that and then they start to eat them and provide some control. That's what's happened on my property. I see wings of these things all over the place because the birds are starting to eat them because I don't have any elanthus. So that's the best thing you can do is get rid of your elanthus, tree of heaven. Thank you, that's, uh, that's very good advice. Um, so uh, as we mentioned, one of the things that all of our seventh graders have worked on is uh, learning about climate change and doing some research. You've mentioned some things in your, um, in your presentation about the ways in which a native garden can help. Uh, so could you kind of elaborate on that a little bit for us? Yeah, a third of the carbon that is in our atmosphere causing problems right now has come from us removing plants from planet Earth, chopping down the forest and, you know, turning what was well-planted areas into lawn. Um, so if we reverse that, if we start putting the plants back, plant the trees, uh, reverse, reduce the amount of lawn and put in uh, uh, almost any other plant is a better carbon sequester than, than lawn. Um, you can remove, let's say we're not going to remove all 30%. Let's say remove 20%. That's a huge help. That's a huge help. And remember, plants are not just building their tissues out of carbon, but they're pumping carbon into the ground through their root systems every single day. And once it's in the ground, the carbon is stable. It'll stay there thousands of years. So the best thing you can do is to get plants back. And of course, if you have less lawn, you're not mowing as much area. When you mow, you're pumping carbon dioxide into the air all the time. Lawnmowers are, are the dirtiest engines that we, we have. So it always comes back to reducing the area we have in lawn. Thank you. Great. Um, a couple more questions. What's the best way to protect caterpillars? Well, uh, don't spray. Don't, don't allow any mosquito fogging. If, you're, if your street is doing it, make them stop before they get to your house. Actually, make them stop altogether. It doesn't, it's expensive and it doesn't control the mosquitoes, but it does kill the other insects, including those, those caterpillars. Um, remember, the caterpillars come from moths and the moths are getting killed by the lights you have on at night. So turning your lights off or putting in those yellow lights are another really important way to, to uh, help, help caterpillars. And then choosing the plants that make the most caterpillars. Oaks, native cherries, native willows, native birches. They're all making a lot of caterpillars. Those are the plants you should be favoring. Thank you for that. Um, the, another question, um, this is a, a fun one. Uh, our students wanna know if you have any fear of bucks. I do, I do not, but there are some insects I have, um, I can be cautious about. So there are a few caterpillars that have little stinging hairs on them. They're called urticating hairs, like the saddleback caterpillar, beautiful caterpillar, but I don't touch it. Uh, I'm not afraid of it. I just, you know, it's, it's risk, uh, risk management. You know what we should really fear is driving 80 miles an hour behind a tractor trailer. We don't fear it at all because we do it every day. But that's dangerous. That's really dangerous. Going out in your yard and counting an insect, not dangerous. Now, my wife uh, has uh, a, a pretty strong reaction to uh, bee stings. So she gets stung by a yellow jacket or something. She'll swell all over the place. So she's, she's careful. She sees yellow jacket. You can identify where the nest is and, and she stays away from it. It's, it's all risk management. Okay, great. Um, see, any more questions here? No. So um, as, uh, as we mentioned, we're, we're going to be planting these, uh, these kits. Um, and so uh, you mentioned some of the things, uh, some of the ways that we're, um, that we need to take care of them so that, so that we can uh, expand those. Um, I, I know that you've experienced some stories from people who have had some resistance because of the look of, uh, of the native gardens. Uh, you, you talked a bit about that in, um, in your presentation. And I, I imagine some of, our, um, some of our families might be a little hesitant when our kids come home with these kits and say, we wanna, we wanna plant a native garden. So what's some advice that you can give our students to, uh, to talk with their parents about the ways that we can do this and, uh, and then 
uh, ways to convince them that it's it's a good thing to do. What people worry about is creating a messy yard that's going to lower property values. So you have to make sure you don't do that. Remember, I say reduce the area of lawn. I don't say get rid of it. Lawn is a great cue for care. So the lawn you keep, you can have swaths of lawn along your your uh, all of your flower beds or, or along your driveway, your sidewalks. You keep that mode. That's a that's a cue for care. It shows that you understand what the culture is. Um, you're just going to have more plants in your yard. If you're trying to create a meadow, there's long periods of the winter time where that meadow is dormant and people just say, well, it's dead weeds, you should get rid of it. That'd be a good thing to put in the backyard where people can't see it. But if you're going to plant an oak tree, put that in the front yard. Um, a lot of people talk about backyard habitat, and I don't like that because it suggests that it's so ugly, we have to hide it in the backyard. And it really isn't. We just have to do it properly. Uh, but in the beginning, if you're cautious, you're worried about your neighbors, start in the backyard and then it'll be okay. okay. All right, thank you, Dr. Ptolemy. This, is, uh, this has been a great um, presentation. Really appreciate you joining us. Um, I know that uh, I've learned a lot and I, I'm sure that our students have as well. Uh, we're excited and we'll keep you posted as to how our, uh, Native gardens are growing here, and you know we'll take a look at the map too. We'll hopefully yes. we'll uh, we'll populate the homegrown national park map. That would be wonderful. Thanks very much, and thanks for the opportunity. All right, thank you. All right, good luck.